Hi, my name is Faith and I'm a pastor's daughter. Back in 1999, whilst on a ministry trip in Africa, my dad was called to plant a church. After three prophetic words, the penny finally dropped and when his feet hit the Welsh soil, he did as God asked. 23 years later, and it has been one heck of a ride. Here's a glimpse of what I've learned on this crazy journey called church. Now, I'm going to let this out right from the beginning. We are not a good church. And what I mean by that is, we ain't your slick, professional, organised church. We are rough as jets, fly by the seat of your pants, one yes at a time type of church. And if I'm being totally honest, I love it that way. One day doesn't look the same as the next and the variety of things going on inside these walls has got me so gripped with excitement I can barely sleep sometimes. Ugh, got to brush down these flipping steps. It's mostly my child that looked nice last night. Typically. It's just a flipping bread everywhere. Everybody else's children as well being in the street. Chaos. Take a few months ago as an example. I was in the middle of setting up a ministry called The Help House and by a miscommunication, it was launched early. By Katie. Lol. It was exciting, but yet heartbreaking. So we hit the ground running to get food and essentials out and all my mates got involved and helped. So we have just started a ministry 48 hours ago. <laughs> 48 hours ago. It's a long time ago. <laughs> um, called the Help House, and within 48 hours, we had over 100 messages from people needing help. The ones kind of that have fallen through the gap of because they're not on benefits, they they're not um, they don't get tickets, they for like yeah. food banks and stuff. Um, so we are reaching the in between. You know, the other people who've fallen on kind of that hard time, they've lost their job or they've become ill, they're not able to pay bills and stuff. So that's kind of what we cater into. Um, so we are just making our way through over 100 messages. We've um, made up some things, thankfully, Church and Remove, um, the church that me and Doris are ministers in. We um, we went to Lidl's and they donated all of this food. And um, so they've done all this. Um, we've got donations coming today from people as well because they're amazing and the supermarkets are donating as well, which is awesome. So that's kind of where we're at this morning. We were filming <laughs> this afternoon. We feed your people, um, but it's the, what the worship effect is. That's what, that's what it's all about. We love it. So yeah, that's what we're doing with toffee because I can't, I can't go up. <laughs> People from all over my town had heard about what we were doing and came to help in whatever way they could. Even our local councillors were coming down with huge donations and helping us get these packages out. So, um, Peter and Mel, who, they go around the supermarkets, supermarkets give us some food, they collect it and they bring it to you then and um, we drop the boxes then with some fresh stuff, not just tins. Everything. Everything Where's Mel? Did she still nurse in her nose? Oh, bless her. Uh. Yeah. This is Peter. Say hello, Peter. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Cakes, That's it. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. I'll come back for more now. Oh, here we go. It's that early in the morning, I can't think. Oh, but we do it. Oh, we know what we do. But kind of. More than we did. That when we started, and I don't even know how long ago we started. Two, three weeks ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, about three, three weeks this week. Three weeks. So since yes. then, as you can see, we've actually got a place where we can put food. Big Um We are running now. I'm going yeah. to shopping in a bit now. But um, yeah, it's all happening. They doing it, so I may as well go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> to be honest, yeah, too many cooks spoil a broth, so uh, sit <laughs> It was such a wonderful time, full of fun and laughter. We shared such special moments at this time. It was a time where we celebrated each other. But this attitude was established right from the beginning of the church. It started with Dad. Right, let me start off with that then. Because John Powell was adopted. Right? So adopted into a family. 
And uh, so, yeah, mum and dad, great and all that stuff, but there's certain things come out there. And I'm not saying this happens with all adopted people, I'm just saying it happened with me. And it puts things in your mind that begin to form a foundation, if you like. Some good, some bad, right? As it is with everybody. I mean, you know, my wife came from a divorce background, you know, mother and father got divorced, so everybody got their thing, right? So it's not just for adopted people. But one of the things one day, I, I had I'd been a particularly naughty boy, and I was a particularly naughty boy. It was a bit... Uh, I wanted to do things my way and stuff, and I'd been in, I'd been in my father's garden and in his shed, and I'd made a bit of a mess. And in his temper, right? Now he, wanna, he didn't have a great temper, but in his temper, he said, hey, never forget this, you tolerated it around here. You're only tolerated, right? And so that came out and cut through like a, now when? So one thing that I learned by that is, is that you don't want to stick around, and he apologized later on. It was something said in heat of the moment. We all do it. He was an awesome man. And I still look up to him today. He's gone on people, you know, the Lord now. But, you know, we all have those moments where things are a little bit tight to the wire and we say things. But I learned something from it. See, always be in places that you're celebrated, not tolerated. Right? Now, you've got a gift in. God says that he's given gifts to the church and gifts of men and women as well. Right? Two people. Uh, so you want to end up, and look... You are never going to be in a place where everybody's going to be, every time you preach, oh, rah, 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 that's awesome. Right? Or I think you'd be making the right call. But what I'm on about is a, is a general culture there where instead of they're always sniping at the pastors and always sniping at the people that are leading, and you're almost tolerated, right? Don't to just don't be tolerated. Go to a place or be in a place or create a place or change the atmosphere where there's a celebration of the gifts that God gives. Not a, not, you're not just tolerated it, you celebrate it. So that's the early part of John Powell. A little bit of insecurity, a little bit of overconfidence, a little bit of lack of judgment, a little bit of thinking over things too much maybe, but we're all like that. So we choose to celebrate everybody, no matter what they bring to the table. Yes, this can be difficult and challenging sometimes, but everyone deserves to be celebrated. Yes, Katie, what, what colour? Red. Red. Do some check yours. Okay, from the top, everybody. <laughs> that was really natural, yeah. <laughs> when I started my choir 14 years ago, this was a principle I put in place right from the off. And as new people joined, some from other churches, some returning to Christ, some unsaved, I wanted to create an atmosphere where everyone is welcome and valued. Not necessarily for their singing, but for who they are. And trust me, we have some characters, let me tell you. I just love it so much. Every year we put on a concert on Christmas Eve for the community, and I can't tell you the amount of fun and laughter we have. To me, this isn't the typical ministry thing. This is me and my friends doing something pretty awesome for Jesus. These people are more important to me than my pursuit of ambition or success. This is Laura, but I call her Ginge. I've known her for about six years now. She came to my choir, got saved, came to the church, and is now a full-time team member of the Worship Effect. She also has taken over the Help House. One of my very close friends, Kelly, joined the choir and she she said oh come along come along and at the time I was going through a really rough stage and didn't leave the house and I was like no 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 I'm not going she got me dressed <laughs> packed me in the car and off we came and for the first time in I would say 12 months I felt complete peace as soon as I walked in here from coming to choir and hearing other people's stories and, and thinking, OK, well, I'm not the only one that feels like this. And listening to stories when we were doing the concerts and how we would talk about God and, and you know, and, and who he is and who Jesus is. And, and, and it got me thinking this one day and it smacked me in the face. I had this big moment of, like, I, it just hit me right right in my heart um and then i looked back on things that had happened through through the years and th and thought okay he's always been with me even though i never knew him he's always been with me 
I could ask questions and I, it was it was never because of the friendship that was built up through the choir no question was a silly question and so it's been a it's been a learning curve but a good one and I've and I'm still learning and I, I'm, like we all are and because I think of the community here and the church it's made it um, an enjoyable process. This is about friendship and camaraderie. We are supposed to be working together for our Jesus. I suppose what I'm getting at is ministry can be such a business minded venture. Visions for this, structures for that, and yes, they do all have their place so that it avoids chaos. But we don't need to model our churches based on the professional standards of another. The people within your church will form the identity of it. Just stick close to the word and love with everything you got. Now, this is Chloe. I haven't known her for very long, but she has become an invaluable friend and a team member of the Worship Effect. I was living in Bristol for and in around the area for about eight years. I moved went from Wales when I was 19. And uh, it's just been a bit of a, a ministry <laughs> overload, essentially, doing a lot of worship leading, being part of churches, but it's been a bit hard because I've had to do these churches a lot on my own. Um, I haven't had people around me really or a team to support me or anything like that. It got to a point last year where I was completely burnt out. I, I just couldn't cope anymore. Um, I was leading worship every single week and just coming from a place of just emptiness. And so it got to, I think, June of 2021, where I was like, I'm done with church. I don't want any part of church anymore. I'd rather just leave be <laughs> and not bother with people because it was just so much easier than, than the previous eight years that I'd, I'd spent. The mindset of ministry in our culture can be so exhausting, especially when you feel completely alone. But what if ministry was relationship driven? forming lasting friendships with people within your church, celebrating each friend for who they are and the gifts they bring, loving each other and preferring each other along the way. I think for me, I, I've always known that I need to be under somebody or be part of a church, but I just never found the right one. So um, for the past few years, I've just been praying God. I. Give me my tribe. That's what I've been asking for the whole time was, God, I just need to find my tribe. I don't feel like I fit in. I feel like a square peg in a round hole. And it, it, it was got to a point where there was never any consistency. Either I was not good enough for some churches or I was too good where it felt like there was just a lot of jealousy and people didn't want to get to know me because I was taking over their spot. So I just... I just couldn't find the right place. I think for me, ministry, you can't do it on your own. That's like the biggest thing. Um, but again, you've got to find the right people to do life with. And for those who haven't found it right now, it doesn't mean that it's not going to come. We have to choose friendship over ministry. I'd even go so bold as to say ministry cannot be effective without friendship. Just look at Jesus and his 12 mates. Church has to be a place where people feel a part of a family. This cannot be an overnight change, but a process to be embraced and a culture to be encouraged. Because deep down, even though, I mean, I was brought up on my own, I was, uh, there was only me in the household, I've got no brothers and sisters. And of course, you, be, you, 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 you can be, uh, you know, um, only sort of children can be perceived as being selfish. As, you, know, you only think about yourself. And yeah, and that's true, you know, because you haven't got to think about anybody else. But deep down, I really, I think I've got a heart for people. Not necessarily for, I'm not a, you know, a sort of kutchy and for people outside of Wales, that's a, that's a hug. And, and, you know, I mean, and I took, as you know, strange, you get the Americans coming over, they're awesome. And they hug everybody, don't they? That took me a while to get my head around that, mine, by the way. I'd have this sort of technique where I'd, I'd, when they go like this, and I put my hand out to shake their hand, and I'd stiffen my elbow up like that. And you could, you can just direct those people wherever you want them to be. I mean, you can just put that off. But so 
I'm not a touchy feely, cutchy, you know, type of person as far as people, right? Because that's not the way that I was brought up. My father, I mean, you know, it's just it's pat on the black. You're right, boy. Yeah, get on with it, like. So uh, you know, I've developed that side. But what I have got is I want to see people reaching their full potential. It breaks my heart to think it when you walk into a graveyard and you walk past these graves. And for the majority of what you'll walk past, you realize because they were outside of Christ, you realize there was a purpose, a heavenly blueprint, an heavenly destiny on each of these people, never fulfilled. And it's gone. You know, I mean, you want about the film Field of Dreams. Walk past a, a, any cemetery as you feel the dreams, but they're all dead in the ground. And, and so that uh, bothers me. It still bothers me today. It bothers me about my life. It bothers me about the people we have in church. It bothers me about you know, the bigger picture. So, yeah, driven with that, if, if you like, to, to help people to see that God is for them, not against them. Again, when people read the Word of God. And it's what really began to, as I got into the depths of the Word of God, I realized, you're a God that's trying by every means possible to tell me that he's for me, not against me. And yet when you go to church sometimes, all it can be is that, and, and from the leadership that can sometimes be in the church, or the type of culture, it seems like God is forever against you. He's forever trying to, 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 to put marbles under your feet, you know what I mean? And, and, and to make you as miserable as he is. Well, let me tell you, God laughs in the heavens. God is full of joy. And so that thing, you know, that, that is, is to show people, hey, look, yeah, you've got faults, you've got failings. Yeah, t- tell me about all that stuff. But I want to tell you something that God is for you, not against you. And he wants you to start excelling and soaring. So that drives me. Yeah. And I pray that a stillness and a desistance That's Doris. I should probably tell you that his name is actually Joel. The Joel I met seven years ago is a very different one from today. From being a frustrated, confused and very guarded person, Joel has been on a journey of discovery. Discovering friendship, family, church and who he really is. You never fit, you have to make yourself fit. Always at a compromise and expense to everything you are. And you're always at conflict with yourself. So church became a place of conflict. Was there anything that, was there ever times that where good things happened? Of course there was. I don't go to church for church. I go to church because of Jesus. But, you know, when you're in places, especially places where you, you don't fit and you, you're not meant to belong, that, that's the crux of it all, really. You don't belong. Uh, they become a place of conflict, they become a, a place of bitterness, become a place of contention. So that's what church was. Church should be fun, uplifting, free. Yes, of course, there's going to be those moments where we butt heads and me and Doris have had our fair share of streaming matches, but it doesn't define our friendship. We choose to journey together through hard times and good. It's been a real massive journey for me. Um, A year ago, I couldn't leave the house. And then through various things, really weird stuff, um, I got in contact with Katie and we were just chatting. We just met up for coffee and we were just chatting about uh, what's going on in our lives. There was nothing going on in mine, but there was a lot going on in hers. And um, I wasn't necessarily jealous but I could see that there was something here that I needed and I wanted to be a part of. Um, And so I was lying in my bed one night and God was like, you need to message them, you have to. I was like, no, they're gonna say no. Why would they want me? It seems like they've got everything that they need. They wouldn't want somebody else coming in. Um, He was like, no, you have to. And it was a big thing for me to (laughs) say, "Um, are you looking for anyone to do some editing? (laughs) And um, so, yeah, so we 
we met, I, we met up and I immediate, immediately felt that there was, there was something there. I didn't feel like home, but it, there was a sense of comfort in what everybody was doing. And, but the last three months since I've been a part of the team is just completely, it's been a 180 from what I was. And I feel like now I'm getting the old me back. It's not rediscovering new things about me. It's actually rediscovering the old things and being like, oh no, that is who I was. That is who I am. But it allows me to flourish and be myself, be more myself than I ever was. Because my whole life, I've always had to change who I was to accommodate other people. But now they unfortunately stuck <laughs> with me for the foreseeable future. <laughs> now, I should say that there would be no Chloe without Bat. Someone had to forge a space so that others could find their place, and Matt did just that. Five years ago, through Dad's prompting, me and Matt set up the Worship Effect, along with Doris and a friend Andrew. This would be a media project to delve into the creativity within our church and to encourage authenticity within our worship teams. So I first started um, attending church and then moved back in early 2003. I uh, met Faith, met, met everyone, and it wasn't long after that, it was sometime in the mid-2003 mid that I started playing in the band. And at the time we were uh, in a town hall in Neath, it was a you know, rented uh, premises, and um, John had to, Pastor John had to bring all the equipment in and out every week. You know, it was very clear that um, he needed, well, he needed help to get all this. You know, we've got, there was two huge Mackie speakers and the big desk and stands and, and, and all this stuff that needed to be brought in from the car down here, up these steps and, you know. So I saw need and I was just like, right, okay, well, I'll be here and, and I'll help. But it was, it was just an obedience that, that I took upon myself because I saw need. Not, not that it made me happy. I wasn't looking for happiness in it. No, I wasn't happy being there, you know, at that time, or, uh, coming earlier, ultimately, to be there when John arrived. And it was hard going, week after week after week, for many, many years. I wasn't happy about that, but I had purpose in it. And the purpose in it was far, far more important to me serving than anything else. And, and through it all, friendships were built and um, forged. You know, trust and, and camaraderie was forged through it all. But, but that forging and that, that shaping of especially my friendship with faith, coming up, to coming up to 20 years now, that was bedrock for what God did with us in the worship effect. If I hadn't had that, then the worship effect didn't start from an employer seeking employees. But no, it was, it was based on a friendship that had been forged, um, a coming together of a like mind, coming together with a vision that, that God has given a small collective, a small, small core of people to say, we're gonna do something here. Don't know what that's gonna look like in future, but we're gonna do something here. And it was all based on an obedience to just see a need recognize I can do something about that need and doing it and, and trusting the people that you're doing it with and being obedient to, to whatever God calls you to. And, and the worship effect was, was really born out of, of all of that. When you're celebrated in your church, then you become fruitful. Being in an atmosphere that sees you is so important. That's not just for those within the congregation, but those in leadership too. It's important to say here that celebrating someone doesn't mean praising them all the time. It's about walking through mistakes and triumphs, discipline and freedoms. Let me tell you, you're gonna get a lot of advice and it's some of the stuff you don't want to hear. So when I came back from Africa, 
uh, I say there was a bunch of people waiting for me, but basically nobody wanted to, you know, they distanced my, themselves from me. The people that I knew was pastors and leaders, apart from one, Ray Bevan. And I, I knew, you know, I known Ray over the years, and and um, I phoned him up and said, right, this is what's happening. And he, he you know, he's very gracious and said, we got a conference on. Come up, he said, you'll be my guest. So I went up with his cousin, who was part of the church, and we, and we went there, to, 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 and Casey Treat was speaking there, a chap called Casey Treat. He's speaking out to ministers and pastors. Now, I've just come back from Africa. I'm ready to go. To go. I was told, when you get off that plane, you declare the glory of God is here, right? So I'm thinking it's going to bang, 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 right? It's going to, and up to that point, it had bang, 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 bang. Um, and I, again, people don't think, you're not in a sprint when you plant in a church, you're in a marathon. Right? Get that in your head. Long haul. Right? Uh, so we went up to KC Treat, and KC Treat said, he said, right, and he, he, given his, he gave his story, an amazing story about him planting the church and the ministry, the world-wide uh, ministry that he had. And he said something I didn't want to hear. He said, he said, it'll take at least 20 years, he said, before you'll even be established. This is the reality. <laughs> what? And he said, after the 20 years, and he mentioned some other figures then, then you start breaking ground. And then you start, but I didn't want to hear that because I wanted it all happen quick. But see, God puts you on a process. And this is what he's trying to get over to people, is that what you are at the beginning is not, you're going to learn all the way along. And if you've given, right, and I've seen this now, I've seen this happen, where you'll, you'll get a character, a real charismatic character will come along. Start a church. That's huge. Everybody's like, like a magnet, right? All the disaffected people in all the churches, like, whoop, there's something going on here. We're going to, right? And it all, it's all singing and dancing, and all they got, everything's in. But because they haven't gone through the good times, the bad times. They haven't learned character, because gifting's one thing, but character is the other side. And so it's been all given to them all, all at once, and it's a lot to deal with then. I mean, you know, we've seen people leading revivals, and then it's just, it's just craziness breaks out. And so what Casey Treat was trying to say, look, if you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to pastor a people, right, to, to get anywhere, to, to achieve something in their own lives as well, you better start thinking long haul, midi. And you are not going to establish anything until 20 years. Becoming a church of the people requires process. It requires challenges and forging to gain a character that can be for all the people. Sometimes we got this wrong, sometimes we got it right, but in all cases, we have learnt. And this learning and forging has produced fruitful ministries within the church. The leadership of, of, of the church we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if it wasn't for the leadership of the church and their, their mandate to release others into their own ministry and their walks and, and what they've got to do for the Lord. I know Pastor John had a word when, before he started the church that if he didn't step out and fulfill this ministry and he had a number of words saying start a church and he'd be kind of, you know, like umming and ahhing whether to do it. The word was if he didn't step out into his ministry then others wouldn't be able to step into theirs and that's like that could that could I feel that I feel that as I don't um I'm not really into titles but you know I guess you could you know I'm creative director or whatever I don't really care what the title is but if I don't step into this role and fulfill this role then there'll be others team members coming on board that aren't going to be, have the opportunity to, 
to get a camera in, in their hands and, and go out and film something that's on their hearts or, or whatever it may be. But God didn't call us to step out into a, a six million pound studio with 12 million pounds worth of equipment and, and this and this and that. No, he just he called us out into something that we can do with what we've got. What we had was a couple of cameras, some lights that are not really fit for purpose, but hearts that want to serve. All he asked you to do is this. He went to the disciples and said, follow me. So I'm a firm believer in that just follow him. Just get onto his coattails and say, wherever you're going, I'm going. Because you know he's forging a way and he'll make a way. So I can say it's, um, yeah, you, you can't take into account everything that's going to happen. You can't take in, you know, and, and sort of be pre-prepared for it. But you have got one that says that has gone on before him. And so if he's gone on before me, he's got the answer for what I need right now. And so there's our openness about it. Not, not knowing it all, but saying, you know, I, I, I need you judgments. I need you counsel now, Lord. I need you to tell me what to do in this situation. Because in the natural, I just want to knock somebody's head off. Right? But I know if I did that, I'm losing out, they're losing out, everybody's losing out here. So what would you do? But how to operate in a place of room enough, out of a place of control, that was, that was a journey in and of itself. And do you know what? I think the thing that made that process and, and, and brought me to a place of, do you know what? I can be me. It, it doesn't matter whether I'm in the congregation, um, whether I'm on a platform, whether I'm behind my instrument. There is a contentment because I am who God wants me to be. And, and all that God has and all that God wants me to be, it's a journey and I will get there because he, he will never give up on us. He's faithful. Um, and so it, it was a place that I learned how to befriend people. It was, it, it was where my guards came down and I learned to let people in because, you know, we all say it so often, ministry is not an individual thing. We have to do it together. That's the way God designed it. That's, that's the blueprint from heaven, us all working together. Um, because if we do everything on our own, we just get burnout. And, and that's what happens, church across church, across church, across church, people end up having to do it all themselves and then they're disillusioned or burnt out or whatever. And, and that's where I was coming into this. Um, and, and it came to a place where it was like, right, Joel, are you gonna let people into your life or not? I want to, I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to. And so the journey was then, suddenly I had friends. Suddenly it's not about me, it's about everyone. And I've always known that and I've wanted it, but now I had to learn how to operate in it. And that has been the journey. And once I learned that, oh my goodness, talk about growing and roots down and fruit flourishing and, and everything else. Why? Because of people, because of people, working with people, having friendship with people, not questioning people. It's so liberating, folks. It is so liberating. You know, having people, because of friendship, forged friendship. Not all the false nonsense that I had had, and then suddenly you don't do anything you don't, they don't like, you're ditched. It's on your bike. You know what? No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about proper friendship, forged, uh, that sticks up for people and has people's back. And it isn't some fad dependent on your condition at the time. Um, it just, it's liberating. And the, 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 the leadership of the church has been always there to, to help us and su supply for us. I've, I've gone through some over the last five years, you know, when, when, since the Worship Effect started. I've had my main monitor die on me. I've had my graphics card die on me. The church has replaced those every single time because they they recognized that okay we can't pay you john pastor john doesn't get paid you know no one gets paid but but there was a need to to, to fulfill and they recognized that they're, they're doing it they're, they're doing it they're doing what god's called them to do flip right they can't do any more work because there's no monitor there's no graph you know it's just like this equipment has failed 
and it needs to be replaced and they've just they've done it and and i'm so grateful for, for that as well but to be in a church that recognizes what you're doing and and encourages it and and supplies the need for it get into a church like that i don't even know what ministry is anymore um i've been so conditioned throughout all my life coming to church on the move i've struggled with some of the things because it's so topsy-turvy <laughs> that I'm like what even is church anymore because the patterns of the western church it, it do not fit with the patterns of the Lord and so I think for me ministry is just a made-up thing by man and it's, it's all about purpose and it's all about our connection to the Father and our connection to people all ministry is, I think I'd like to put it down to love the Lord your God and love others as yourself. That's all it is. Well, church is completely different. Uh, church is a place of freedom. Church is a place of expression. Uh, church is a place of friendship. Church is a place of belonging. Uh, was there a journey to the friendship and belonging? Oh, yes, there was. Yes, there was, because I had to learn to trust people again. But it's become a place of belonging. And as you know, we use the word tribe, isn't it? It's become my tribe. It's become a place of friendship, a place that's real and, and tangible. One that I can be who I am. Other people can be who they are. And they bring what they bring as an individual. And it makes up this cumulative thing that's so powerful, so God pointing, so God ordained. You just can't deny it. You can't help but be drawn by it. Why? Because God's in it. So young men and women out there, women as well, young men and women, that you look on now and you see your pastor there and he's browbeaten or she's browbeaten with worries. and cons Don't look at that. Look to the exciting thing the possibilities of leading a church or a group in or an assembly and doing something that is investing your life, sowing it into other people, because the reward that you will get back, there's nothing to compare with it. So you see, church is about journeying together. It's about going through the learning process, embracing the changes and having fun. But before I leave you, remember what dad said about being adopted. Well, the story didn't stop there. Yeah, I think it was the first Sunday that both of my parents came and they did a bit of a tour with uh, John, who was the pastor. And he was telling us all about Frank Joshua and Seth Joshua. And he just happened to mention that they didn't get uh, the death certificate. They didn't know how Frank had died. And the previous um, six years, well, for three years, I was working as a probate genealogist. So that was literally my thing. I was, I was searching for death certificates, marriage certificates, birth certificates, you name it. I could find it. And um, so I said, cool, just let me know the dates. And then that night, within five minutes, I found it and I'd ordered it. And then the week later, um, it came in and so I, I gave it to John and I think he was quite pleased with that. Um, and then the next day Faith came in <laughs> with her dad's birth certificate <laughs> and somebody else's birth certificate. And I was like, there you go, find her. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, oh, it's obviously very important for somebody who's adopted to find their mother and to find out who they are. And um, yeah, so I, I, got the certificates there was one for him and his birth name and then there was one for a, a woman's name we didn't know if it was linked or not but it was a, a potential and so um, when I when I left uh, the church that day I was on the trip I was waiting for the train and God said you're gonna find her and so um, it didn't take me very long but we managed to we managed to find her essentially and I've never been so happy <laughs> when I saw her marriage certificate and, 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 and it matched up to both the certificates. It was, it was like, oh, job done. We've, we've got her. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty wild ride. It didn't take us very long, <laughs> even though it took him 20 years to get to that point. But 
you know, when God is in it, he does it at the right time and he does it really quickly. And so I think it's been the right time and it's just been great to be a part of John's journey, really. Uh, and so I didn't realise in 2022 uh, that God had somebody lined up. You see, you are an answer to people's prayers sometimes. In fact, God is not going to bring pennies from heaven sometimes. You know, you're going to bring that sort of supply. You're going to meet somebody's need. You're going to be that answer to prayer. And so I've been praying all the time, making declarations, every Feast of Tabernacles, and lo and behold, God brings Chloe into the fellowship. And then she found my mother after a, a sort of false start, if you, if you like. And, and I wrote a letter, and it was on a letter on a Tuesday. So it must have arrived some, sometime on a Wednesday. And I hadn't heard nothing. There was no response at all. And I thought, well, you know, anything. It, we, it's, it's stabbing into the unknown. It's stepping into the unknown. We just don't know what's happening. So on a Friday morning, I was, at, I was at work in front of my computer. I work from home, just doing some work in the computer. And the phone goes off. And then I recognise the, uh, the name at the bottom, that it was a place near where I knew that my family was, was, was from. And I thought, oh. I just pressed it and straight away this voice came down the phone and she uh, said her name and she said, yes, I am your birth mother. And, um, and it was just the most unbelievable experience of my life because I did not, even though I was looking and searching and seeking, even asking God, you know, but when something goes from the faith into reality, it's, it's staggering what God does sometimes. And so we got chatting on the phone and I could tell people it's, it's a strange thing when you've never heard somebody's voice uh, say 61 and a half years uh, ago that I heard that lady's voice and when she had to let me go and, um, and to hear that voice and to think I know that voice, I recognise that voice was very bizarre. Uh, and so we sort of chatted away and then we arranged to meet up. And this whole family has opened up to me now that I never knew I had. And the whole thing of it was, which is very important for adopted people, is that you always get this feeling that you weren't wanted, that you weren't celebrated, you were just tolerated, and the quicker you could be pushed out of the way uh, and onto somebody else, um, you know, well, best of luck type of thing. And uh, just when we were walking around and um, on that first visit, and she whipped the photograph out, of me as a baby um, before we part the company. And I, I said, I've got a photograph exactly the same as that. It must have been taken by this mother and uh, sort of baby unit. And she said, well, the thing is, she said, I've carried that photograph around with me all my life. And she said, the thing is this as well, she said, I didn't want to give you up. She said, I had to let you go. There's no other choice. There's no choices. We did our best to try to work it out, but it was just not going to work out. Uh, we had to let you go. But she said, I've thought about you every day of my life. And I wonder, and of course we were walking on and she'd say every now and again, I can't believe this is happening. I never thought, I never thought this day would ever come. And it's that whole thing that you just realize that, you know, when you get this, you get this idea, this, these pictures coming to read about what the situation is and for somebody to turn around and say, oh no, no, it wasn't like that. In actual fact, you were thought about. I thought about you every day near enough, and certainly at birthdays and Christmases, because I was with her for my first, my first Christmas. I was born on the 19th of November, so I was with her for Christmas. And, um, and so at those highlights of the year, if you like, would really bring it. But she said, you were celebrated, you weren't tolerated, you were, you were wanted, and it was only out of necessity and the sort of policies back in, the, back in those days that I had to let you go. So that's important to you. But you know what? It's, uh, it just brings everything. It brings that sort of completeness. The big question mark that's over my head disappeared, just like that. And you realise that you're not tolerated, you're celebrated. So there you go. That's 20 plus years of Church in the Move in the bag. But we are still learning, and who knows what we'll look like in another 20 years. But I can tell you, we are all here for it. <laughs>